So we've heard a lot about uh, some of the uh, sort of traditional uses of, uh, of the plant, but I think the, the real future for hemp is in some of the really new uh, and interesting applications. Um, there's actually a researcher here in New York State that's working on, uh, has developed a process to take hemp fiber and make it into a replacement for graphene to be used in supercapacitors, and it's uh, dramatically reducing the cost. It's a great example, but our next speaker is working on another really cool sort of cutting edge application. Um, it's old and yet it's new, uh, and what do I mean by that? It's, and Tim's gonna tell you all about it, but in any case, the next speaker is Tim Callahan, and he's really one of the, um, the US experts on working with a material called hempcrete, which is uh, a mixture of hemp and lime. And um, Tim, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tim's company, Alembic Studio, has been involved uh, in, in building a number of um, hemp houses around the country, uh, but especially in the North Carolina area where they're based. And uh, so please welcome Tim Callahan. Thanks, Eric. And thanks everybody for being here today. On a, I think it's still a beautiful day outside. Um, we're having a, gonna do a little technology shift here, and I'm hoping it's gonna go somewhat seamlessly. If not, we'll work it out. Um, I'm really kind of surprised and honored to be on the stage today and with all these folks whose, whose shoulders we stand on, and I had never imagined eight, nine years ago when I started down this path that I'd be standing here today. I've been in the design build business and across a lot of disciplines for almost 40 years. And there have been a number of points over that time that were real turning points for me. I think the main one was probably, or the one that's, that's really brought us me here today was in 2007 when I uh, attended a conference or a presentation by Ed Masria, who was a former head of the American Institute of Architects. And at that time, that was the initial, uh, the initial presentation where he put forth the 2030 challenge, which was to say that we should all, as a society and a culture, and certainly those of us in the industry, commit to building a carbon neutral environment for all of our buildings by the year 2030. At the time, and still am, uh, being, you know, having a small design firm, my partner and I looked at each other and said, you know, we don't need to wait. We're small, we have the ability, we have the agility to just like decide to commit to doing that right now. So why not, let's do it. We didn't know what that was gonna mean really, uh, but we did make that commitment and started the development of what we hoped, we had no idea how, what was gonna happen, what it was gonna be or look like or anything. But we said, let's see what we can do if we create buildings that are a synthesis of modern engineering and mechanical systems with mechanic or with natural materials that incorporate natural materials to the greatest extent possible. So as part of that effort, and kind of setting those design parameters, uh, for the energy component, we looked to Passive House which is a German certification program uh, which emerged in the late 1980s. And at that time, there had been about 30,000, a little over 30,000 passive houses built to that, to that standard. It's a really high metric, um, uses maybe 10 to 17% as much energy as a typical home. And that, so that was one of our, one of the goals we set. The other was to use local natural materials to the greatest extent possible. Having such a high energy standard, we really didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So we started researching. Fortunately, the Passive House uh, library of materials and details was pretty extensive that time with over 30,000 projects under their belt. Uh, the only issue for us, and it's changed since then in the States, but the only issue for us at the time was that a lot of those materials and methods were difficult to obtain and or execute here. However, that's what we had to work with. So we were, we were going down that path. In the process of that, someone walked through our door and said, I heard about this stuff called hempcrete. And I thought, oh great, you know, here's, um, 
we, we've had kind of our fingers in the, in, I've got some experience in the natural build world, and I had become somewhat accustomed to people coming in with something that was going to be the magic bullet approach. We're going to save the world. If we only build with this, and if we only build with that, ever, all of our problems will be solved. Well, it's never that simple. It's a complicated process, and there are so many things that happen in a building and it's, in its interaction with the environment. But um, I said, okay, well, we'll check it out. So I went to um, speak to someone about it. They presented me with a lot of information. I came back, I said, okay, well, this is worth looking into. Uh, and we did. We spent about the next two months continuing to do research with it. And I think, let's see if this thing works now. Is this where it's supposed to be? No, nope. no, it's supposed to be way back. Isn't this rolling? No? My partner, Luli Abrera, is helping me out back here. Thank you, Luli. Um, okay, this is, these are some international projects. That'll work. Okay. Um, so, we did the research regarding hempcrete and said, uh, surprisingly, our goals for energy efficiency in terms of just being able to get a pretty high insulative value, air tightness, and especially uh, lack of toxicity. And there's a really unique component of hempcrete, which I'll, I'll get into a, in a little more detail in a minute, which is that it really is an incredibly hostile environment for mold. Um, so in terms of taking care of a lot of the issues that, that can develop in wall systems, particularly in cooler climates, uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing product. Um, fortunately, again, we turn to Europe, and most of these images are from uh, some international projects. The, the ones we had earlier didn't come up. But there had been in, uh, some of these are from South Africa, but primarily projects had been executed in Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK that over the past 20 years. It really originated in France, um, but it spread throughout Europe. They, so we looked to them for a lot of assistance. We had to do a lot of our own innovation due to due to you know, constraints we have here based on materials availability and labor, the labor pool. But uh, we're very grateful to our European counterparts you know, for all, the, all of the work that they did and which we have been able to build upon. So, so what is it really? Um, I mean, how many of you have heard of this stuff? Cool. All right. Uh, so this is Hempcrete 101. Uh, what is it? It is basically a combination of three materials. Hemp herd, which as Eric mentioned earlier, is the woody core of the plant, uh, a lime binder, and water. Uh, all of these are reasonably accessible. The shiv itself, or also called herd, is, is made from that, the inner part of the plant there. Uh, after the epidermis, the very outer layer, and the bast fibers are stripped off and it's processed. Um, there are uh, theoretical standards in terms of, of optimal size and, and moisture content, and it's got a little bit of fiber in it. It's not, you don't necessarily want something that is pure of fiber and herd only. It typically has a little bit of fiber content, which is just fine. The lime binder is really the magic ingredient in this, and it's what makes it all work. Uh, lime is one of the more plentiful minerals on the planet. It is, uh, it is not consistent, however, in different places. I mean, different deposits have different chemical makeups, and this is very, very important in how it gets used or whether it gets used at all. Using an appropriate binder, whether it's a hydrated lime plus um, a hydraulic binder and additives uh, that just make it harden, or hydraulic binders have natural pozzolans in them, which are hardeners. Um, but this is, this is really critical. We always urge people, don't, there, there are a lot of recipes out on the internet where if you are so moved to go build your, your hempcrete home, that you can find recipes out there and some will say, oh, you use this, this, and this, you know, 411 or whatever kind of ratios they give you, just please don't do it. Um, 
you will pay a little bit more to get a commercial binder that has been tested and approved and you will have a successful project. The last thing any of us need is for things to fail. It's so sometimes folks think they're going to save a little money up front. Oh, I can make this myself. Well, yeah, okay. But you may be calling for help later. So, and it's a lot easier to get it right the first time. Um, so quickly about lime. Um, as I said, it's incredibly plentiful. It is produced with heat. Uh, the, the, the lime is crushed and heated to about 900 degrees, 8 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, um, at which point it takes on certain characteristics, and again, that changes depending on where it was, where it was, was uh, quarried. Um, at, at the point at which water is added back in, this is where it gets really interesting. And when water is added back into this lime mixture, it begins to absorb CO2 from the air. So there's CO2 in production, the heat that's created when the lime is produced. There is uh, a little, uh, the lime itself does give off some CO2 when it's heated, but when it starts to dry, it's seeking to revert back to something akin to its original form and it's absorbing CO2 from the air. There are those who claim that this is a, you know, that a hempcrete wall is carbon negative. Um, frankly, I don't buy it. Um, there's, I mean, I think, I think really that's wishful thinking. Uh, there's no really solid data out there that I have seen to support that claim. However, uh, there have been studies that show that, that Given the performance and, and end use, longevity, a lot of all factors considered, hempcrete really is, in fact, the lowest carbon footprint, even not, not taking into account the longer term energy savings that you can achieve in a building. Hempcrete really is the lowest carbon footprint material that you can use in your envelope. So um, I think that's just dandy. Oh, we can't forget the water. Uh, H2O, most of us are pretty familiar with that. Okay. The original, originally when hemp was used as an aggregate, it was, it was with concrete. Now we call it, now it's mostly hempcrete and there's a little confusion because hemp and, or, or the lime hemp mixture is very different in performance and characteristics from a hemp cement mixture, which is Portland. Um, basically derives from the same source, just processed differently. The primary differences are that lime is permeable. The lime wall is permeable. It will, take, it will take on moisture and release it. Cement is not. It's flexible, which has its good points. Um, it's really relative to concrete or cements, even in, a, in just a plaster form, it's, it's quite plastic, uh, which doesn't mean it won't, that it won't crack, but like we can do some pretty large expanses with lime with no control joints uh, where you could never ever get away with that with any kind of a cement finish. Um, that the rigidity factor also means it's the fact that it's not real rigid as concrete is means that it's not not as it doesn't have the structural capability of concrete. But it does it is hygroscopic. Hygroscopic simply refers to the ability of something to absorb moisture. Uh, it's weatherproof, but not waterproof. It's actually incredibly weatherproof. Uh, we have, I have a sample I did a year and a half ago and that has not been plastered, and I just wanted to see what happened. It's a small wall sample. I've left it out in the weather with no covering, no finishes, no anything for, I think it's for 21 months now, and there has been absolutely no, degra no degradation, no mold, no anything whatsoever. And as I said, uh, the lime will absorb CO2, not claiming it's carbon negative, um, as opposed to concrete, which is, or cement, which is energy, incredibly energy intensive and really um, accounts for about 7% of global CO2 emissions. Um, so why would we use it in a building? Um, we don't use it in all of our designs. We use it in most of them, uh, but not all of them. It's not really, you, depending on where you live, it may not be the best thing that you could do. Uh, I think, you know, as I said, buildings are complex systems and, and the way that people live in them uh, is an, another factor. 
Uh, so they are really tailored to climates. However, in most environments that we encounter, it really is, it, it really is optimal. So this is a quick primer. I want to talk about what, why this is really why we use it. So once upon a time when people built, not that all buildings are built out of wood, but in, when, when wood frame buildings were constructed, there was no insulation in the wall. There was something on the inside, maybe, and something on the outside, usually, uh, but nothing in the middle. So what happened is that things could go, would move through the wall. Heat and moisture and wind, whatever, would just flow right through that wall. And, you know, things tended to balance out okay over time. Uh, I've done a lot of deconstruction of older structures that had no insulation at all, and I'm always amazed at, at really, generally, how good they are inside. You know, you can take a look inside behind all the finishes. Um, then we decided, whoa, we're, we're wasting a lot of energy here. You know, we need to put some kind of a blanket around us so that we're not having to burn incredible amounts of fuel just to stay comfortable. So we started putting insulation in walls. And, and these are, again, simple graphics. But uh, then we started learning that, well, you know, things need to, you know, if you get water vapor into a wall, which is a gas, if it hits a dew point in that wall and cannot get out, it's going to condense into a liquid. And this is where, and it's got nowhere to go, and this is where problems begin to develop. Um, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but if, you know, personally, if I walk into like a, if I go into a really moldy building, you know, I feel like I'm doing a jump into a, into a nuclear reactor because I've got like two minutes before my lungs just say, you got to get out of here. Uh, so, what this, what we can do with this material, and, um, oops, is, we're not, we're not trying to fight what I consider just a force of nature. If, it's like fighting the tide, if water wants to go somewhere, if there's an imbalance anywhere in the world, you know, there, there is, it's always seeking balance. So you've got an indoor environment and an outdoor environment, and there's something between them. We have a wall between them. So what can we do that's going to work with the forces that are instead of saying we're not letting you in or out? Because that's when, that's when I think we think we've got more control over things that we don't and problems are generated. So what this does, and which is why I really, this is truly, I don't love this because it's hemp. I love it because it works, and it addresses so many of the, of the challenges that we face as design professionals and people that are trying to, to, to create a better environment for our clients and for future generations. So this is the green hempcrete. It's not really green. It's really gray. Um, but what happens here is, and again, these are simple, but the water, water vapor, um, there's, there's an insulative component to the wall, but the thing is, if, when water vapor is moving in and moving out, it's absorbed by the lime, which adheres to the hemp, and I have to say that initially it's like, why are we using hemp anyway? Why don't we just like use chopped straw? And it would be a lot easier, our lives would be simpler, um, we can, you know, it's, it's still, it's an industrial, uh, co-product or an agricultural co-product, um, but hemp has itself has some inherent antimicrobial and moisture characteristics as well as a, as a relatively uh, high silica content, which allows the lime binder to achieve a chemical bond and not simply a mechanical bond that's better than with these other materials. So, but what happens when the vapor comes in in the wall it's absorbed, whatever direction it's going, it's absorbed by the lime, it's held in a solid state, or not, well, it's just held, it does not condense uh, into a liquid, and as, as the humidity changes, it will release it again, and it can do this, it's like, it's a, it's a truly breathing wall, as long as you maintain the permeability of the interior and exterior finishes. So it does not have, um, oh, right. 
as I said, it's a pretty hostile environment. It has a, it has a pH of about 12, which is really quite alkaline. It's interestingly equivalent to the acidity of limes on, on the other end of the scale. Uh, so this makes it pretty, as I said, hostile to mold and bacteria. Uh, rodents don't like it, not friendly to insects, um, I think, however, having said that, if you're designing in southern climates where Formosan, particularly where Formosan termites might be an, uh, an issue, I would definitely still pay attention to uh, termite detailing for that. Um, I mean, it's wishful thinking is uh, not always the best. So as I said, it has, it has an insulation value of approximately R2.5. Um, you know, R and R value is really just a measurement of how much it slows down heat movement through a wall. This is less on, an, on a per inch basis than a lot of other normal, so-called normal insulations, like maybe dense packed cellulose or, God forbid, fiberglass. And those are about 3.5, theoretically. That whole, the way that whole equation works is it's more complex, but I think and just that, you know, the given R value is a good place to start, just like, okay, we, we can start from there and kind of see what, what we're going to, how this wall is going to behave. A typical two by four wall has an R value of about 13, um, two by six wall, 19. Uh, our, our typical hempcrete wall is about, is 12 inches, which gives us an R of 30, R value of 30. Um, actually, it's a little, just a little bit less than that. Um, and frankly, if we're building, you know, we don't build R13 walls ever. I just think, you know, that's like, even if you're in a location where that's code minimum, code minimum is really just what you can get away with. And we don't consider that really, um, since the envelope is so critical in the building and its long-term energy performance, we don't consider that like adequate uh, or responsible to simply do the, do the minimum. Um, so there are, there are a number of ways that you can implement this material. Um, the first one I think that we're showing here is a sprayed application. This is, this is when it's applied into a wall cavity with a, uh, something that's very much like a shotcrete gun that they use to make swimming pools, except here instead of concrete coming out, you have hempcrete coming out. Um, we've never done that particular method. Uh, there are, I, I have some reservations about it and haven't had the, and probably because I don't have, haven't had an opportunity to play with it. Um, panelization is really gaining a lot of traction. It's made a lot of headway in Europe. There are some companies right now in the United States, um, and there's one right here in New York, and somebody in attendance here who is working on that. Um, so, I think that, that's something that holds a lot of promise. Panelized systems, uh, I think, are going to, we're going to see a lot, lot more of those as we go on. Um, the third one, and I think we've already ripped through it up here, it may come again, are, is our blocks, pre-manufactured blocks, where they can be either laid up like typical concrete blocks, CMUs, or there's a company in Canada now making an interlocking system. I think that looks pretty good, and it's, you know, I, I think they're, Costs appear to be, um, at least the ones they've given me so far, are looking pretty competitive, and uh, they are in the process of testing and certification for that right now. So, um, designing. This is what, this is where it really gets fun. Um, you know, this is as I said, that's a footprint of a building we did in Virginia Beach. Um, the just kind of going from the ground up. You cannot use you cannot use this below ground. It's not. It's just not suitable for that. It doesn't. It's not foundation material. I mean, some people want to use it everywhere, um, but definitely not below ground. That's not what it's for. Um, so it does have certain uh, certain things that are really different in terms of detailing. And as anybody who's ever built anything or tried to fix anything knows, you know, it really comes down to the details. So most of these have to do there with water. As with any building, you want to keep, water keeps us alive. Water can be the death knell for our buildings, you know, so take care of your roofs, especially. 
But the biggest things that we're concerned with tend to be like the, the, the intersections at the sill, which is where the, the walls meet the foundation, and window and door details, uh, and, and, so, and uh, what, what's going on at the top plate. Some of these things have to do both with being waterproof and for air tightness and attention to these details and understanding, you know, how that's going to work now and into the future is really critical. Unfortunately, right now in this industry, there's not, you know, in a, for a lot of things, there are some, you can go on and, and get technical specifications for all kinds of things. Oh, I've got this application, I want to do it this way, and you'll get like a detail that's been done 10,000 times before. Um, we don't have that. Um, we will have that, but and when I say we, I'm, I mean the collective we. Um, you know, I think that's something that, that is going to evolve over time, and I think there ultimately will need to be in industry standards for how all this works, just for the good of all of us, and to ensure that what we do really um, is enduring. Um, but the main thing in this really is, is understanding, just understanding the properties of the material. All materials have unique characteristics. Uh, what they like, what they don't like, what they're good for, and what they're maybe not so good for. So I think there are definable, um, qualitative, physical properties of hempcrete that have been established, that have been tested, that have been certified. Maybe not in the United States. We rely a lot on laboratory data from, uh, from across the big pond. Um, but it's there, and I think so. This is really just doing your research and, and paying attention. Um, because even though, even though, as I said, this can get wet, you can soak this. I mean, it, it's not like it will not rot like a typical wall. You know, if it gets really soaked, um, it can stay. It can stay soaked and it won't rot. But it's just not good practice. So we treat every detail as if this were just, you know, we're keeping the water out where we where we want it to stay out, and we allow it to breathe almost everywhere where we want where we want it to breathe because that's what makes it so. Awesome. Um, okay. Okay. I think the last thing. So I talked about blocks, but the, then the last method really is the ca is casting in place when you when you're mixing this material or using this material, um, in which forms are built around. And this is just showing it built around a stud frame wall. It, um, that's one method we've done. We've done structural steel frames that set to the inside and within the wall, and we've also uh, and and you can also do timber frame. These are bags of hemp. Um, this is the recommended mixer. Go back to that. This this is or will it go back? Maybe. Um, most people use a typical mortar mixer, a paddle mixer that's like this, and then you dump the material out like this. Um, we really recommend finding or even purchasing and then selling when you're done, whatever. Get a, get a, a, a pan mixer. The one that was shown was an Imer 760. This will, this will mix large quantities of material. Um, and instead of the, the paddle going around like this, it goes like this. It drops out the bottom. You can mix larger quantities. It's easier to handle. It reduces your material handling time. So even if you're fabricating panels or casting in place or whatever, um, you know, having the right tools always helps. Um, so, once it's, and when it's, when it's cast, really, it's very simple. It's not heavy like concrete. The formwork does not require a lot of bracing because it, you don't have to worry about it blowing out. It's not a liquid. It's r relatively light. When it's wet, it's about 25 pounds a cubic foot. Um, so, it's pretty easy to work with. The material goes in the wall. Or if you're making panels, even it's on the floor and it's screeded out and flat. Uh, and then after about a day, it's dried sufficiently; it does not cure as fast as concrete does. But after about a day, you can you just move the forms up the wall. You kind of work your way around the building like this, almost like you're building a coil pot. Um, so it's fairly straightforward, really low tech. Uh, there it is. That's the one. Um, and it takes some real care, and you need to pay attention to your, the mix. Consistency of the hemp, lime, water mix is critical. Uh, 
uh, most of it, most of the installation really is just, a, it's work. But having, you know, so if you're doing this and having someone who's responsible and really cares in charge of the mixer is, is a pretty critical component here. Um, once those forms are removed, you're left with a texture, you're just left with that wall. You know, it's, it's the material that you see. In some cases, it's left bare, um, which can actually look pretty sweet. Um, really, generally, you need to plaster at least one side of it simply to cut down on the air permeability of the whole system. And I'm not talking about vapor, I'm just talking about air whistling through it because it's pretty, it's pretty porous um, inside the wall. So these are some window details. I think this, these are 12 inch thick walls. Those are 16 inch thick walls. So they're really pretty sweet. Um, this, this thing of putting the window in the middle of the wall like that is really a, has to do with energy performance and, and is kind of a typical passive house kind of approach. Um, but it also gives you really beautiful uh, sills, interior and exterior. Um, so the other, just going to finishes then, uh, the, so once those forms come off, you're left with this sort of bare concrete. You can leave it, to, I wouldn't leave it to the outside, but it, 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 it does do some really, inter it can look really cool on the inside. But whatever you put on, it has to be vapor permeable. So usually, um, you know, we do a lime finish on the exterior and either a lime or clay based finish on the interior. And both of those things will allow water vapor to pass right through at a, at a sufficient rate that the, wall, that the interior of the hempcrete can do its job. Um, don't, but you, using paints on it, unless they're absolutely just mineral paints, not a good idea. Um, you, won't, you won't kill the wall, so to speak, but it will no longer have the ability to do the thing that we love, which is to take that moisture out of the air and just hold it until it's ready to let it go. Um, I still love looking at these pictures. <laughs> this this one, well, well, we won't go back. Yeah. What's that? Oh, okay. This is a this is a project with well, that that one. Yeah, this is a project that we're starting a hempcrete installation on on Wednesday. Um, it's the biggest thing we've ever done, uh, and. It's, yeah, it's, 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 been a real, it's been a real gift and a challenge to make this happen. So, um, but we're gonna do that in install on Wednesday and I don't know how long it's gonna take. There's a lot going on there, but I think we'll probably be posting some video on that as time goes on. I think, I don't I could go on for a long time, probably longer than y'all would want me to, um, but just, I'm gonna close and just say, you know, we couldn't have gotten here today um, without like a lot of other people that have labored in the trenches that are, you know, who, whose, whose faces and voice, are, you know, faces are unseen and nobody knows about them, but there are so many people out there that have worked so hard to get us to where we are today, all of us. And I'm really grateful to them and you know, on a broad scale and also just on our own efforts there have, you know, in our community, uh, when, we, when we started on that first project, there's a project we're doing in Maui. Um, when we started on our first project, we had no idea how we were gonna pull it off. We just said, we're gonna do this and somehow we'll see what happens and it actually worked. And it worked because people just were inspired. They said, this looks like you're really doing something worthwhile. And people were inspired and they just like showed up. It was amazing. Um, I wouldn't count on that again, but I'm just, but it really was, you know, I'm so grateful to everybody who has made all of this possible and, um, and allows me to come up here today and talk about it. So thank you all.